We're in John chapter 15, verses 4 and 5, and I'm going to start off with a kind of a humorous illustration. I have a purpose in giving you this. Sometimes illustrations are there to, to get a, a, a boring crowd that just won't wake up uh, to wake up, and you get them laughing. Sometimes you do it for that reason. Sometimes a preacher just needs to get a little bit uh, comfortable in the pulpit before he gets started. And uh, sometimes you get carried away with that stuff, and you have lots of jokes and lots of things, and people begin to wonder, is he ever going to get to the message? We are going to get to the message. One night a wife found her husband, they were brand new parents, found her husband standing over their baby's crib. He was looking down and she was watching from behind him and she thought, wow, he's in such deep meditation. He's just really grateful for this precious baby that God has given to us and amazed at how God has blessed us in such a, a way that he's blessed us. And she was so touched by all of it. And she walked up by him and she put her hand on his shoulder and she said to him, a penny for your thoughts. He said, honey, i got to tell you, this is amazing. I don't have any idea how anybody could make a crib and only charge $46.50 for a crib like that. You know, I have a purpose in that illustration. And I really hope that that will take hold in this message that I'm going to bring to you because I'm going to be giving you a lot of explanation here about why we're dealing with the subject we're dealing with. But that's how a lot of us are, just like that dad was. You got the amazing birth in front of you of a child, the gift of life that God has given. All the fingers, all the toes, all the other things that you wanted to be there, and God has blessed in an abundant way. And yet all you can see are the peripheral things around it. Sometimes it's the negative things that we began to see. At least in the illustration that I'm giving to you, this was a guy who was caught up in the crib that it was laying in. But he was missing the real blessing, something far greater and far better than a crib for $46.50 was laying there right in front of him. Now, I'm, I'm starting by an illustration because here's what we're going to do. I want us to come to an understanding this morning, if you don't already have this understanding, that if we don't have the Holy Spirit of God to guide us in what we do, the work that we have to do can't be done. It's an impossibility. Now, that's why I've had you turn to John chapter 15, but before I read any of that, I want to focus your attention, if I can, when is the last time you've seen what you believe to be a great work of the Holy Spirit of God? I mean, things were so obvious that it was Him and it couldn't be us. When's the last time you did that? You know, I really got to thinking about that, and, and there are several instances in my life that I can, I can probably refer to. I remember preaching in a conference. It was a big conference. It was one that I always enjoyed going to, and it was on the closing night, which was, is the night that you like to be able to preach because you've got tons of people that are there. And I remember that as I was there, I was nervous because I was going to be preaching. The place was full. I saw lots of my friends, preacher brethren that were there, and so you want to make sure that you're doing things right because preachers look at other preachers when they're preaching in a different way than anybody ever looks at it. They look at the homiletics, the art and science that's going on behind the preaching. They understand things that are happening that many other people may, may perhaps not even know that are, are going on. And I remember that as I was sitting by the pastor, I think like right over here, the last song was done, the last special. He stood up and gave an introduction. And I immediately, immediately, when I stood up, I felt the presence of the Holy Spirit of God upon me so dramatic it almost knocked me that back down to the floor. Now, I'm, you're not in a Pentecostal church, nothing against Pentecostals, but Baptists don't normally talk like this. And I'm bringing this to your attention because there's a work that's going on down in Somerset that many of you don't even know about. It is a revival that's going on a bunch, with a bunch of young people that's being uh, held in the First Baptist Church down in Somerset. They're not the ones that are sponsoring the revival. That sponsorship is coming from Future Christian Athletes. Am I right about that, the FCA? Okay. Future Christian Athletes. Donna and I and, and a couple of girls, uh, Tiffany and, and Emmy, or who was it Emmy? No, it was, uh, who was it? Jana. It was Jana the one with us. We went down last Monday night just to see. I'd heard about it. I heard they started off with somewhere between three and 400 young people in this revival and that it had grown to way over 1,000 people. In fact, um, getting a little bit ahead of myself, uh, Beaver Quarter, who has been responsible from what I understand and helping to get this revival going and, and, and continuing on, he sat down next to me when he saw that I was there 
And he said, Brother Don, it's, a, it's an amazing thing that's going on here. And I began to ask him, what's the reason? I'm going to tell you the reason after a while. But he told me, and I think he was right about it. From my understanding, nobody, unless you guys know about this, nobody's been reporting on how many people have been saved. Uh, am I right about that? Any of you that know anything about it? I haven't heard anybody say that. Nobody's keeping count of the people that are coming forward and receiving Christ as their Savior. But we know that it's happening. And the reason we know that it's happening is because kids are coming out of there and saying, I got saved. Uh, there are kids that are coming out of there and they're saying, I have rededicated my life. Now, we happen to know about that because one from our own church, uh, not a member here or anything like that, but attends our church, said that they went forward and rededicated their life. But I don't think that was reported to anybody. Here's the point I'm making. They're not out to impress everybody and say, wow, look at this revival that's going on. We've had, we've had 150 people saved in this revival. and They're not doing any of that. None of that's going on. There's just an amazing work that is happening there that, that they're aware of there locally, but I don't, I don't know of anybody that's I started to say bragging about it. That's probably the wrong word that I want to use. I don't think anybody is going around and saying, do you know how many people came forward tonight? There's lots of revivals that we'll talk about like that. Wow, the altar was covered. We had 150 people that came forward. We might say that. They're not doing that. They're not saying that at all. I can tell you that the night that I was there, um, the altar was packed. I, I can say to you that the night that Don and I was there and the girls, uh, that it not only was the altar packed at invitation time, but all throughout the service there were young people coming forward and getting on their knees and praying with each other and then going back to their seat. And I think some of them did that multiple times. Not being critical when I say that. I want you to know that because I thought being critical and going into all of this. I saw lots of praying that was going on with these kids. I saw a lot of kids that were hugging each other. I saw a lot of kids that were weeping. Saw them as they would go up to the altar and kneel down with someone or go get someone who was in the pew and kneel down with them and then walk away. And, and both of them weeping with what was going on. You know, when Danny called me about this, I forget when it was, Danny, last Sunday night, whatever it was. Uh, Matt would have been telling him about it. When he called me, I decided, here's what hit me. He said, have you heard about the revival that's going on? And he began to tell me about it as I'm telling you about it. And when he did that, here's what came to my mind. Did you know that every major revival that has gone on has been preceded by revival among young people? They've been the stimulus to it. I thought to myself, maybe that's what God's doing here. Maybe God is preparing to bless us with revival. And, and if that's happening and this is where it's beginning, I don't want to miss out on it. Do you? I, I don't want to miss out on it. I don't care what church it's at. If it's going on and God is blessing it, I don't want to miss out on it. Now, I'm going to give you my account of what I saw there. Because uh, you could look at my generation... I'm 65 years old, soon to be 66, and as we get older, we, we're not very fond of change, feel a little bit insecure with change. I felt very insecure when I went down this revival. <laughs> there were kids everywhere. I mean, out in the front of the church, they were all just all over the place, these teenagers. And listen, you, I dressed the part. I want you to know that. Uh, everybody's used to seeing me in a suit. Can you believe I did have on a sports coat, and I did have on, I think, a blue shirt. Did I have a blue shirt on? I had a blue shirt on. And a pair of Levi's, wore a pair of Levi's with a, with a dress coat. I don't think I've ever done that in my life. But I got to thinking about it. I don't want to stand out like a sore thumb as though that would stop it. And when I walked in, I stood out like a sore thumb. You know why? Because I'm 66 years old. And I didn't see any other ball-headed people there except old people that happened to be there too, like me. And I felt a little bit insecure. Felt a little bit relieved when, when Beaver came and sat down by me and began talking to me. Because he's uh, not as old as I am, but he's getting up there in years too. I thought, this, I'm, I'm really going to watch this. And I felt constantly the prodding of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, you go ahead and watch it and absorb this. But Don Staten, don't you be critical of this revival. It's hard to do for us, isn't it? We see somebody else that's uh, having revival. Heard this. Just, just did hear this. Had a lot of people that are being saved and people that are going forward. And, and I'll hear people say, yeah, well, you don't know what's going on behind the scenes there. That's, it might seem like it's a revival. We're ready to excuse it, aren't we? Not because we're doing the job, but we're just ready to excuse it and be critical of it. And the, and the Holy Spirit of God, I believe, is warning me about that. Don't you do this. Don't miss out on this. The service started about 10, 15 minutes late. And I didn't see anybody that was bothered by it except me. 
and maybe a few other adults who kept looking around and, and checking their watch and looking around like, you know, come on. I mean, this is 10, 15 minutes. But the young people, I never saw a kid in there looking at a watch. Probably didn't have a, a watch. They didn't care. They knew what was coming. I didn't know what was coming. Well, when the music began, it was loud. <laughs> it was repetitious. They had drums over here, and, and I was glad I was in the back because if I'd have been in the front, my ears would have exploded. And, and I, couldn't, I would not have understood the words in the song except they had, they had screens all over the place, and I looked at the screens. And I must tell you, even though it's not my, my choice in the music that I was hearing, I found myself enjoying what was going on. I really did. The, the, the music, the words in it were repetitious for sure, but I could tell that God was present. But more than anything, the kids that were around me, that's what was touching me. Uh, they knew what was going on. I, I expected this to be like a, like a rock concert because it was that kind of music and expected that we'd see lots of kids jumping up and waving their arms. And, and, and that wasn't going on. None of that was going on. It was really pretty quiet, just to tell you the truth. I did see a, a kid here and there who would raise their hand, you know, some of them two hands, one guy in particular, blonde headed guy, a black guy, they were, raising, they were raising their hands like this. So I just took it all in and began to listen to everything that was going on. And, and I thought to myself as, as they were winding down in the music, I thought, well, if there's a revival going on here, it sure isn't because of the music, I can tell you that. The devil was trying to creep in on me, wasn't he? Some of you I know are saying, no, the devil wasn't creeping in. I think he was. Here I was kind of down on the music because it's just not my, my choice. And um, they called on a 17-year-old kid to stand up and give his testimony. The kid really touched my heart. Turns out that he's the child of the leader of the band that was playing the music that I couldn't understand, and it was so loud. And this kid, when he stood up, told me something. He had a dad and a mom that he loved very much, that he really cared about what was, who really cared about what was going on in his life. And he talked about how he'd rededicated his life there in that revival that, that week. I thought to myself, whatever this guy's music may be, there's one thing I know about him. Listen to me. He's real. He's real. The preacher was Greg Locke. Greg preached for us here. I think one service was just one service, a couple services, two He's a dynamo. I don't see how anybody can talk that fast and, and, and keep sense in what he's doing. This guy does it. And he's all over the place. He's over here. He's over there. He's down here. He's down here. You know, I don't move around. You know, you know that. And as he began to preach, he began to talk about how he doesn't use notes. Well, I, I saw that. But usually, W.A. Crystal taught me this, that usually you've got your notes in your mind. You see point one, point two. In your mind, it's there whether you have them in front of you or not. He said, I don't use notes, and he said, you know what, normally what I do is I get a thought in my head, and I find a scripture, and I just take off from there. And I thought to myself, well, they're not having revival because of the preaching. I mean, can God really bless that kind of preaching? I mean, is it possible? Well, not only is it possible, he's doing it. Now, stay with me. We, we, get this, we got this down pat. Get the right kind of music, get the right kind of preacher. Get the right kind of atmosphere. Revival's going to come, right? Wrong. Here I was sitting here taking all of this in. And as I was taking it in, Be Beaver sat down beside me. And I began to quiz him. What brought this on, Beaver? And you guys decided on April the 11th to have a youth revival. You invited a guy to come. But what brought this on? And he just smiled at me and he said, it's the Holy Spirit. I said, holy who? Just kidding with him. He said, Don, this is a work of the Lord. He says, we're, we're also, he says, let me tell you what's going on. We're not going down there and dealing with kids. He says, the young people are going down with the young people and dealing with the young people. He said, because we're discovering something here. He said, Noah Broughton taught me this a long time ago. Just stand back and watch God move. Do you mean to tell me that God is capable of having revival with us just standing back and watching him do what he does? You can't have revival like that, can you? But we should try it sometime. Holy Spirit spoke to my heart when Beaver said that. And here's what he said to me. 
Watch me as I move. Watch me as I move. Now, you may be thinking, okay, but you're not telling us any results that you know about. Well, I have told you some. The hugging, the crying, the love that was demonstrated there, I was blown away by. Our kids weren't just going forward. We had a, a young couple in front of us. In fact, a number of young ladies in front of us. I don't know what was going on. I still don't know what was going on. But they saw this lady, a grown woman, standing over from in front of us, and they went over one by one, tears running down their face, threw their arms around this woman. They stood there. I'm talking five minutes with her arms around this woman, sobbing together. I don't know what that was about. I don't know. I don't know. It was a mother. I'm not sure what that was about. All I know is that God seems to be doing a work. Jeremy was telling me um, recently that Greg Locke um, has a, a work that he's trying to do. He's trying to raise money for Bibles to send to India. And when those kids in this revival found out that he was doing that, extemporaneously took, a, took an offering up and got $1,500 from those kids to put toward Bibles. I'm, I'm talking senior high school kids and middle school kids. Now, you can call that anything you want. I, I'm glad that they're trying to reach people who may be on drugs. Who knows what the difficulties may be, but, but here's my point in everything that I'm telling you about, this long extended thing I've been talking about. We need the Holy Spirit. Bible Baptist Church needs the Holy Spirit. And if we don't have him, we will never have revival. I, I don't care who. We can bring the most high-powered evangelist in here that we want to bring in. Not interested in turning to rock music. We've been through that. We're not interested in it. We got the music that we like. That isn't going to bring the revival. I'm not going to tell you praying is not going to have a powerful influence on it because it can't. But I want you to follow with me either on the screen or the Bible in front of you. And I'm going to read to you John chapter, the Gospel of John chapter 15, verses 4 and 5. The focus of this message is on the Holy Spirit. I will never get all this message done this morning. And so I'll be continuing on this coming Wednesday night with the last point at least if we get that far. Starting in verse 4, John chapter 15. Jesus is speaking when he says this. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can you except you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. He that abides in me, and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. Now, here's what I want you to get, this last phrase. For without me, you can do nothing. For without me... You can do nothing. Now, that's really important because we're going to find as we go on in this message that what Jesus is talking about is you've got to have him and what's going on or he ain't going to make any difference. I don't care what the results may appear to be. It really won't make any difference because it's got to be Jesus involved in the person of the Holy Spirit of God. And we're going to touch on In fact, let me just go ahead and get to that. Let me, let me read to you. In fact, you might want to turn to this in Acts chapter... No, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13. Now, you may be thinking with me, well, do you think the Holy Spirit of God is present here right now? I mean, when you prepare this message, do you, do you feel like that he's here right this very moment? Well, I know he is. I don't have a question in my mind about that. But it's not because of any dramatic thing that I can tell you. I'm going to show you how I know that he's here by reading to you Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13. He's writing to the church at Ephesus, born-again believers, and here's what he says to them. And whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. And whom also, after you believed, look at this, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Now you may be getting the idea that what he is really saying here to the church at Ephesus is, the Holy Spirit came to that person who got saved, and he kind of put a Ziploc on them so that they would stay saved, and then he left again. That's not it at all. That verse is teaching us this. Every person who is born again that receives Jesus as their Savior, listen to me, the Holy Spirit comes and lives literally, not figuratively, literally, he comes inside that person, seals them by his own person, by his own presence, and nobody can take that salvation away unless you can defeat the Holy Spirit of God, and nobody can do that. 
Now, how do I know that he's here today? I know that he's here today because he gives the Holy Spirit to every born-again believer. How many born-again believers do we have here? Would you raise your hand? A lot of people. That tells me that there's a lot of people that are sitting there right now, and they have the Holy Spirit of God indwelling them. Now, that might be news to you. You may be sitting here and thinking, I didn't know that. Well, now you know it. God's with you wherever you go, and that's not a figure of speech. He's inside of you. He knows what you're thinking, not just what you're saying. He, know, he doesn't just know the bad choices that you make in life. He knows every thought that you have. He knows something deeper than that. He knows every motivation inside you that is going on. He knows everything about you. The Holy Spirit of God. Now, I'm, I'm really dwelling on his presence here, and so hang with me there and go to Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Because this is the first point I want to bring to your attention. It's imperative that we understand it. You have God living inside of you if you're a born-again Christian. That's the only kind of Christian there really is. A truly born-again Christian is a person that has received Jesus as their Savior, and they're going to heaven. They're going to spend eternity with the Lord Jesus in heaven. That's imperative for us to grasp that. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 says this. Then Peter said unto them, Repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Here it is. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, I can, I can recondense that, and I can bring it across to you in another way. Without well, doing any injustice to Scripture. If you're an individual that's born again, that means you've had your sins that have been remitted. That means that you have uh, been baptized in the name of Jesus. That means you have repented of your sins. Those are the things that accompany a person that's really born again. Now, don't misunderstand me. I don't want anybody thinking that we take in that water and that's what, get, that's what washes your sins away. Baptism has never washed sins away. It is, a, it is an emblem of what has happened. It has nothing to do with getting you saved or saving you. That has to do with Jesus and his blood and only his blood that can take the sins of a man away. Now, there are those who believe that the Holy Spirit is some kind of an inanimate object. That he's just kind of there, you know, kind of like the guy with, that was looking at the, the crib instead of the baby. That's kind of like the Holy Spirit is to them. That the Holy Spirit is kind of like that crib. No, that's, that's not what the Holy Spirit is at all. Theologically, people that are like that, that just think that he's some figment of our imagination or he is an individual that's just some kind of out there somewhere, we need to come to an understanding that theologically, the people that accept this idea of the Holy Spirit, that he can live within us, they don't think the Spirit does very much. And maybe that's by experience. Let me ask you a question. To your knowledge... What, has, what difference has the Holy Spirit of God ever made in your life? Now, I, I know you can go theologically and say, well, you just covered it. He saved me. He sealed me. I understand that. But I'm after something very practical. Where in your life has the Holy Spirit ever done anything for you that you know of? Some of you look so confused. <laughs> You're saying, are we in a Baptist church? Yeah, you are. Yeah, I still believe once saved, always saved, and all the other stuff that we believe. But I'm really interested in the work, listen, the work of the Holy Spirit. I'm really wanting the work of the Holy Spirit. You know, I can understand why some people, when you begin talking about the Spirit, they get really turned off. Because there are some people that have such bizarre beliefs, unbiblical beliefs about the Holy Spirit. My wife is a prodigious reader. That means she likes to read a lot. And my wife has always got a book in her hand. I mean, she is so boring to travel with. She, I, I'll be driving down the road. She, I look over, she's got a book, and she'll read it. If I happen to need to use the restroom or something, we're going to be going somewhere, she'll be standing by our front door waiting for me to unlock the front door, and she's reading the book. Don't waste any time unless she's reading the book, a book. And in the book she's reading, this one happens to be about shakers, bizarre, strange stuff that they're doing. Now, I'm not talking about stuff like that. I'm talking about what the Bible teaches us that the Holy Spirit can do in our lives. And I need you to, first of all, recognize that he's living right now inside of you. See, that's why I can preach to you, and I'm addressing myself now to those of you who have never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You've never come to a place in your life where you looked at yourself and said, I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. Don't need a preacher to tell me that. I know by experience in my life that I personally am a sinner. I'm no better than anybody else. I'm a sinner. You've come to that understanding that you're a sinner and you've trusted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. 
I want you to know that if you've done that, there's some amazing things that he wants to do for you. Now, I'm going to read to you John chapter 16, beginning in verse 7. John chapter 16, beginning in verse 7. This is Jesus speaking here when he says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. This is Jesus saying that he's going to go away. Now he's going to give us the reason that he's got to go away. For if I do not go away, the Comforter, that's the Holy Spirit, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, listen to this, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. He'll reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Not the powerful preaching, not the great prayer warriors. He says, the Holy Spirit, this is his work. He does this. You know, I could sum this up in another, another way and say to you, he's the one that saves people. And that incorporates a number of things that happen to a person when they trust Christ as their Savior. I hope you don't mind me using you, Daniel. I know there's a lot going on in your life, and, and you may not even want me to. I don't know. But Daniel, last Sunday, just showed up at my office. I think it was last Sunday. showed up at my office door and, and looked at me and smiled and said, I'm ready, to get, I'm ready to get serious about God. She's really been trying hard to do that. I happen to know some people that were at Toyota South where she uh, sells cars at, and uh, they were up there this week, and they said, you know, she was sitting there with her Bible, and it's all marked up. She's already got a brand-new Bible. It's already marked up. Taking her Bible to work with her? Come on. What is wrong with you? She does that. Now listen to what's going on. She does that because God, through his Holy Spirit, is doing a work in her life. Now I want you to think with me for a moment because this is really where this is going. Who do you know? Come on, stay with me. Who do you know that God is doing a work in their life right now? Somebody that you know. Is it in your family? Son or daughter? Mom or dad? You can tell God's doing something. It may not be dramatic. I mean, it may not be this earth-shaking thing like they had on the day of Pentecost, which I really wanted to preach on that today, and God said no. I'm not talking about the, these, these tongues like as a fire coming and sitting on their head and people speaking in languages that they've never learned before. I'm not talking about any of that. You just see something unusual happening happening in that person's life. See, I know that there's a number of things where that kind of a thing is going on. <clears throat> we need to be aware of that. The Holy Spirit is doing a work. He's always doing a work somewhere. You know your, your studies and experiencing God, it, it, he tells that all the time. God is at work all of the time. Holy Spirit is at work all of the time. And most of the time we don't see where he's at work at, but sometimes he lets us see where he's at work at. Sometimes it's in our family members. Sometimes it's in people that are at our work. But we, we look and say, wow, there's something going on there. Well, if you see it, he only let you see that because he wants you involved in it. Isn't that what we learned in experiencing God? See, that's why it's such a valid question. Who do you know? What have you seen in someone's life that has convinced you the Holy Spirit of God is at work in their life? I see it, so he wants me involved too. See, the Holy Spirit was to be Jesus' connection to us, his power within us. The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit of God does many things within us. And they're on the screen behind me. He helps us in our prayers, even, even when we don't have the knowledge to know how to pray about what we need to pray for. And, and I'm just going to say this in a general way. I know because I'm a pastor and I counsel a lot with different people at various times in their life. And I, I know that there are people right now listening to me who, who God wants to do a work in their life. And you're holding him off at bay. I mean, you're pushing him away. You need to do what Danielle did, uh, totally unknown to me. God was working in her life, and she came in. She could have just screamed that to me and said, Brother Staten, God's working in my life. That's why I'm here, because that's exactly how I took it. That tells me something else that's going to happen to Danielle and every other believer that comes to this understanding. If the Holy Spirit of God is at work in your life, there's somebody else who knows that he is, and that's Satan himself, and he's going to fight you tooth and nail. 
He'll put bitterness in your heart. He'll bring the same old temptations in front of you that used to rack your life and lead you into sin. He'll do all of those things to bring you to a place where he can wash you out and fill you with such guilt. Did you know that every single sin that you've ever committed, ever will commit in the future, is under the blood of Christ and has been forgiven by God himself? But Satan does not want you to remember that. He uses that as leverage against you to make you feel guilty, to stop you from doing what you need to do in your life. And so he helps us pray. He helps us to understand the deep things of God's word. He guides us. We'll be getting into that. He says, go here, don't go there. Talk to that person. You don't need to talk to that person. He does that kind of stuff. Listen, if the Holy Spirit of God is a person, I don't, I don't like using the word Holy Ghost because we get this figment of imagination that on the travel channel somewhere on the weekend we can find that they're hunting for the Holy Spirit of God and, and he's floating around out there somewhere. That's not what we're doing. That's not who he is. He occupies the hearts of men. He literally comes into buildings like Bible Baptist Church and lets his presence be known in a dramatic fashion when he wants to. Or goes to a church where it's filled with teenage kids, listening to the kind of music that we wouldn't listen to, doing some of the things that we wouldn't do, and he says, I am in there, and I'm doing work there. Well, we all need to be really careful about something. In fact, I told Beaver this when he was talking to me, because he was kind of feeling me out, and he said, Brother Don, God's at work here, and he, he stopped. He just stopped and looked at me. It was like, do you, do you believe me? And I said, Beaver, I don't want to be guilty of claiming that something is not a work of God when God is the one that's doing the work. I'm afraid we do that. We've got a man who's going to be coming, being with us beginning on March or May the 20th. Pastor Freedom Baptist Church, David Sargent. I saw our community come together to fight off and stop from coming into our community the sale of alcoholic beverages. And I'm told by Steve Smith and others that the reason that Rock Castle County, listen to me, the reason Rock Castle County was special in this and, and defeated it almost two to one when we finally took, went to the booths, he said the reason that you defeated it is, be, listen, listen, you defeated it because you all came together. All of you came together. You know what he meant? All of the churches that are against this, we came together. Pentecostals came together with the Baptists. We had other various denominations that were there. We weren't there to change what our fundamental theological beliefs were. We were there on one subject, on one issue that we were trying to defeat, and we knew that if we were going to be able to do it, we had to bring everybody together, and so we did, and we won. Now, I'm, not, I'm not sure even where we're going to go with all of that, but I know that God really touched my heart for this man. David Sargent is a wonderful, wonderful man. Am I trying to be a Southern Baptist? Not at all, but I love the Southern Baptists. I came to love the Southern I love the Pentecostals. And I'm just not going to be critical of them. I'm just not going to do it. Listen, the Holy Spirit guides us. He teaches us. He empowers us. He is, he is within us, and he can give us everything we need. But I think sometimes we're so critical it just, it just stops the spirit right in his tracks. The power of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that what he promised? Acts chapter 1, verse 8. I'm on point number 2, Joe. The power of the Holy Spirit. I'm convinced that without the power of the Holy Spirit, there'll be a lot of frustration in our attempts to serve God and even in our witnessing. Listen to this in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. We've got to get this. But you, he's talking to his disciples there, 120 of them. First church. But you shall receive power. You shall receive effectiveness in my work. After the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and then you, and then, after the power comes on you, and then... You will be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, it's imperative we get this. That's why the title of the message is what it is. Prerequisite of the Holy Spirit. Because what he's pointing out to us here very, very plainly is that you've got to have the power before you can have the effectiveness. You think lost people can do God's work? Maybe in one sense of the word, but not, not like it really needs to be done. 
We're not after just feeding the poor, although we feed the poor. We're not just after trying to get people who are sick, get them healthy, although we would love to see that. It's a lot deeper than that. We're out to see souls that are damned to hell be changed by the blood of Christ so that they can go to heaven and live forever with him. The Holy Spirit first comes and then the work. Now, that seems kind of peculiar because listen, listen to this. I want you to think about this for a moment. These people that Jesus is talking to, these people had already been with Jesus through his entire ministry, three and a half years. They'd already been with him. And they'd been trained by Jesus, sat at his feet, absorbed his teachings, even gone with him to surrounding cities to preach about the kingdom of God and how it was at hand. And yet now he says to them, even though we've been doing this work, I want you to stop and I want you to wait till the Holy Spirit comes because until he comes, you can't have the power that's necessary to do the work that needs to be done. Therein lies why a lot of us, including us, cannot get the work done because we're relying on our ideas, what somebody else did that seemed to work, when we need to look to the Holy Spirit of God to give direction and say, here's what I want you to do. Not many amens on something like that because we're kind of afraid of it. They could have begun witnessing without the Holy Spirit, but it would have They've been going without the power of God in their life. The work of God that needed to be done couldn't be done. You know, sometimes <laughs> I read this and I thought, man, this really fits. Sometimes you probably feel like it would be much easier in doing what we're doing if we would just use our own way. You know, in fact, I think that's how most of the time we think. It's kind of like when Lucy in the old Peanuts cartoon, she says to Charlie Brown, I would have been a great evangelist, Charlie Brown. Charlie Brown says to Lucy, you would have been a great evangelist? Really? And she says, yes. I convinced the boy that sits in front of me in my class, I convinced that boy that my religion was better than his religion. And he looked at him and he looked at Lucy and said, well, how in the world did you do that? And she said, I hit him over the head with my lunchbox. Think about that. Listen, we got our own ways. But they're about as dumb as in this Peanuts cartoon. There are people sitting in this auditorium right now that are really hurting. It scares me. I can pray for them. I know the words to say in a prayer. I know how to do that. Went up with Curtis Saturday morning. And by the way, Darla, is um, she's going to get out of intensive care. It's, it's old blood that's from the surgery. It seems that it's there mixed with water, and they're waiting for all that to work its way out. And once it's out, they'll put her out in a regular room, and she's going to be okay. And he was really upbeat. He says, you know, the doctors are really positive, and I'm really positive about it. And he said, but tell the church so that they'll keep praying for it. Listen, one of our primary jobs for God is for God's spirit in this world to convict people of their sins. Some of you are sitting here right now. Listen, please stay with me. Uh, it's, it's about two minutes till 12. I'm not going to be much longer. I'm only going to cover this point, and that's going to be it. Did you know that there are people that need to trust Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior that are sitting in here right now? By their own admission, they're as lost as they can be. If they die somewhere today out there, they're going straight to hell. So senseless. There are people that are sitting here, they really want to listen to what I'm saying, but the pain that's in their heart and in their soul is so great, they can barely hear me speak, even when I'm yelling. There are people in here that if some of you had to bear what they're bearing, it'd knock you right over. Do you understand that this is a work that can only be done by God? I put my arms around Curtis and reached out with my hand by Darla in the intensive care unit. I just, my heart was so moved by what they're going through. And he just kind of put his head over on me and we began praying. I know how to do that. I know how to go into a room and get on my knees beside a bed and pray for somebody that's going through terrible pain. I know how to take somebody who's had a terrible loss in their life. I know the right scriptures to turn to and what to say to them. But none of that means anything at all. Unless the Holy Spirit of God touches their lives and blesses his word, it's nothing. This 
This is work that can only be done by God. Convicting people of their sins and consoling people because of their hurts. People that have the need of knowing what righteousness is and the closeness of judgment. That can only be done by the Holy Spirit of God. You and I have been called to do one really simple, it really, it is simple. He said, be a witness. What does a witness do? A witness testifies of what's going on about something they know about. Preferably something that's happened to them. And the verdict may very well hinge on the wellness of that witness. Good. It doesn't mean that our testimony is not important because it takes the Spirit of God. In fact, it would do us well to look at this. Turn to Romans chapter 10. I'm going to read you just a few verses there. Romans chapter 10. This has to be done. If this is not done, then we're going to find that it's just not going to work. It is our part. For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Did you hear that? For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I don't care what the sin has been in your life. I don't care how horrible the sin may be. You turn to Jesus and ask him for forgiveness. There is not a sin that you can name that he will not forgive. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? That doesn't mean just me. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Now I want you to see the implication of that. The Holy Spirit cannot save and will not save unless the word has been presented to people about the knowledge of who they are and what's going on in their life and what they need to do about it. But when we speak and do what he says, he says, I'll bless that and I'll promise you that I will. The Apostle Paul put it this way. He understood the great, one of the greatest preachers that has ever lived, un unquestionably aside from Jesus, the greatest theologian that has ever lived, that wrote the greatest theological book that has ever been written in the book of Romans. And yet the Apostle Paul, he wants us to understand some things about himself. All the churches that he established, all the people that were saved, listen, look what he says to the church at Corinth, a worldly, ungodly church in many ways. He says, and I was with you in weakness, in fear, in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. The power of the Spirit was what the demonstration was. Not his pulpit ability, not his immense knowledge about the Word of God. He says it was the power of the Holy Spirit of God that made the difference. Zechariah understood that. He said it in this way. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Now I'm going to finish with this. I remember a preacher saying to me that there was a man that he had been dealing with who would come to church repeatedly. And for the longest time, that man wouldn't make a decision for Christ. He said when the time came, that man would grip the pew in front of him so powerfully that his knuckles would turn white. And he said, and all of a sudden, in one of the services, he comes down the aisle and he trusts Jesus as his personal Lord and Savior. He said, I said to him, what's made the difference where you came in this service? He said, I wasn't really thinking about what I preached. He said, I didn't think I did all that great that morning. He said, do you know that little old lady in your church? I said, who is it? He described her to him. He said, yeah, I know who you're talking about. I'll call her Sister Jones. Sister Jones is a committed Christian. She's been coming to our church a long, long time. He said, well, Sister Jones came up to me and said, you know, God has just spoken in my heart to say something to you. He wanted me to say to you, that he's ready to save you if you'll let him. He came down the aisle and got saved. Do you understand that even something as insignificant as a little word like that, blessed by the Holy Spirit of God, that it goes deep into the heart of the one that he speaks to?
Now, here's what I would like for us to do for the next five minutes or so. Would you bow your head with me for just a moment? Dan, get us ready for an invitation, if you will. Some of you are visiting, and I know how, it's, how it is when you're visiting in a church. Feel a little bit insecure, kind of like I did going down to that youth revival. Feel a little insecure. I want to just say to you that you're among friends. Our church is, is really glad that you're here today. We really are. We may not know all about you, but something brought you to church. And we are pretty firm believers in the fact that if God brought you to our church today, he wanted you to hear this message. He wanted you to hear it. And no matter how it's been delivered, I want you to come to this understanding that the Holy Spirit of God loves you and he wants to wrap his arms around you. And he wants to help you. But he's a God who never forces himself on anybody. He never has and he never will. But he wants to put his arms around you and heal you. He wants to give you everything that you need in life. But he won't make you do that. Now, How can you do that? Right there where you sit. Right now as I'm speaking to you and Christians in this church are praying for you. He sees your thoughts. And he's speaking to you now. And all you need to do is acknowledge, Lord, I know that you're speaking to me. I know you are. I can tell what you're saying. You want in my life. You want to put my burdens on your shoulders and you want to carry them. And you want my load of sin to be taken upon yourself so that I can be free from sin and live forever with you in heaven above. Now I'm going to ask you to do something. Just about everybody in this auditorium has done this at one time or another. The associate pastor is standing right here. Brother Jeremy is a loving man that will help you. Just stand to your feet and make your way down the aisle. God has spoken to you and you hear his voice. It's a still, quiet voice. And you feel this desire to go forward. Then you need to understand who's doing that. That's God the Holy Spirit that's doing that. He wants to take you by the hand and lead you down the aisle to change your life forever. That's what he wants to do. And that's what we want you to do. Nobody's looking around. I'm the only one. Jeremy, we're the only ones looking around. Why don't you stand to your feet? That might be hard for you to do. But right now, just pray this little prayer. Lord, I can tell you want me to go forward. But you need to help me. Take my hand. Give me the strength that I need to do that. You pray that, and he'll give you the strength you need. Just stand to your feet right now. Find the aisle closest to you. Brother Jeremy will see you coming and he'll help you. He will. Come on, do that right now. Lord, I, I hear your voice. I know what you're saying. I really want to go. I really want to step out and go up there. I'm afraid. Fear never comes from God, ever. It comes from the devil. Just say yes right there where you are. I'm ready to give you my life. I'm ready to believe upon Jesus as my Savior. I want you in control of my life. You just tell him that and mean it in your heart. You'll walk out of here today with eternal life. I want you to step out and come forward so we can rejoice for you. Would you come? Even in the balcony, just stand up, make your way down. Make your decision today. Come on, my friend, I'm waiting. We're going to play through one more verse before we sing. Trust and obey. Happy in Jesus, but to trust in Him.